Strategic Living with Brian Holmes, episode number 35. Welcome, everyone, to the program today. My name is Brian Holmes, and you have found the Strategic Living online radio program. What a delight to have you with us on this journey and being a part of our community. Hey, we're all about transforming minds, developing leaders, awakening dreams, activating destinies. We want to see you become all that God has created you to be. It's going to be an amazing program today. Boy, have I got a surprise for you. Wherever you are, just open your heart, engage your mind, and let's get on with it. I'm so excited. Can't wait to get started. Let's do it, everybody. I am ridiculously excited. I guess you can probably hear it in my voice. I probably didn't even do the introduction right, but that's okay. Uh, This episode is going to be very different for us today in that uh, we're going to take a departure from what we normally do. Of course, we've done interviews on the program before, but man, oh man, today I have the privilege of interviewing one of the most significant people of the 21st century. Uh, This man is literally known all over the world, needs no introduction He is known by a single letter, and he's also known by the number 43. I want you, without further ado, to welcome our guest to the program today. Well, it's an honor to be with you, Brian. How are you today? Mr. President... I cannot tell you what an honor it is to have you on this program. I just can't even believe it. It's great to be back out there in the radio podcast land. I tell you what, you've got some experience of this, don't you? Well, you know, uh, we've uh, we've done a lot of uh, uh, Saturday chats and uh, an awful lot of speeches, and sure have. It's been a it's been a a roller coaster, (laughs) and I like roller coasters. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, you've you've been out of office now for a number of years. What what are you doing with your time? What's keeping you busy these days? Oh man, we got the uh, we got the institute. You know, we got uh, uh, the painting. I'm having so much fun learning how to uh, access uh, life by by painting it. You know, it, it, Brian is fun. You, you you look at you look at a tree, and all you see is a tree. But when you have to paint it, then <laughs> There's bark. <laughs> wow. That's profound, Mr. President. Now, you know, you on this program, we talk a lot about living life to its fullest and honoring God. And I, I tell you, I, I so respect you because you are have always been a man of principle. Uh, the times that you've been in the public eye, you've never uh, had to deal with scandals or other issues that so many that have gone before you and after you maybe have experienced And I know so many people appreciate your example and your integrity and the way you walk your life. What do you attribute that record to? I was I was raised right, Brian. Uh, Mom and Dad uh, were always uh, examples of unconditional love. And even when I had my my wild days, they 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 never uh, held that to my account. They always loved me with incredible grace and. And it's just been amazing uh, being being their kid, you know, and uh, and and they taught me uh, great principles right from from the word of God, really, from uh, you know uh, timeliness, uh, loyalty, friendship, devotion, family, the importance of faith, all those principles. They they are they are bedrocks of my life, you know, and and so a decision has to be made. They come right to the surface because they are so deeply embedded down into you know, um, heart. And so it's, it's very easy when you have that, uh, to achieve, uh, what I like to call synergicity. You know, that's when two halves come together to make a great big hole. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you and, and Miss Laura Bush, uh, after your presidency, you moved to my hometown, Dallas, Fort Worth, and uh, you guys have been living in Highland Park and and recently, man, what an amazing thing to have opened your library. 
Tell us about your experience with all of that since you've been here in Dallas. Well, it's just been uh, fabulous to be on the campus of SMU and uh, to have the opportunity and privilege to uh, be with my peeps. You know, I, I'm a Texan uh, at the heart, and uh, what a what a thrill it is to to introduce the world to the the great state of Texas, and also uh, to what it means to to be a decider on the highest level. And we wanted to build the library in such a way that it gave folks a a taste of what that's like, and also a a tour of uh, the eight years of uh, the White House. And uh, yeah, I think we did a you know pretty good job. Well, I tell you, it's it's been getting rave reviews here in the Dallas area, people coming from all over the world to experience uh, what you and your team put together. And we sure are grateful to have you right here in Dallas with us, man. Well, I have one more question for you, Mr. President, and that is this. Uh, what's on your agenda in the next couple of years? What You know, we talk here on this program a lot about goals and about uh, life planning and about moving forward and, and thinking forward. What are you thinking about these days? When you have the chance, Brian, to affect a life, and I've uh, held uh, AIDS babies and, and, and had the privilege of looking into the eyes of folks that have uh, been rescued from diseases and stuff like that. It gives you a, a deep sense of mission, a deep sense of valuing every moment, every, every hour. And, you know, you, you realize that you can make a difference in someone's life, and it's just uh, it, it, it's, it's addictive. It's, it, it's saving lives is... is uh, it's fun. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, George W. Bush, and I just have to tell you now, I'm sure you figured it out by now, but uh, at this moment in my life, I don't have the clout to get George W. on the program, but John Morgan, a dear friend, this great man travels as the face and the voice of President George W. Bush. He speaks at corporate events and faith-based events all over the world, brings so much joy, so much inspiration to the people that he stands in front of and honors our country by by honoring those that have served our country. And, uh, you know, it's just fun to watch him work. And I tell you, he, he has this great ability to combine a very hilarious but respectful impression of the president and uh, also occasionally will throw in a couple of faux pas uh, and some parody songs and different things just to bring an inspiring and uplifting message about hope and determination to those that he has the opportunity to serve. And, you know, it, it's what, back in, well, we'll talk about your story in a minute, John, but, you know, back in 2000, just sort of almost like an accident, a divine accident, I suppose, uh, John discovered that, man, he he might have a calling on his life to really utilize his looks and his talents and his abilities for that. He's been on all kinds of programs. America's Got Talent, Family Feud, Headline News, Hannity and Combs, ABC, just you name it, he's been there and has used this this edge, this uniqueness that God gave him to do something of great significance. And uh, man, John C. Morgan, my friend, I am deeply honored to have you on my program today. Gosh, welcome, man. Well, thanks, Brian. I, I have to tell you, I have been called many things, but I have never been called a divine accident. <laughs> How about that, huh? It's the first right here on the uh, Strategic Living Podcast. That's right. That's right. Well, what, man, a, what a hoot. You know what? You and I, uh, let's just give our listeners a little bit of a backdrop. We, we met in February of 2013, and uh, that was in Nashville, Tennessee. We were attending a Michael Hyatt conference together. And when I say we met, we literally just met. We didn't get to know each other. We didn't really have conversation. Uh, we had a couple of short little in, uh, interchanges. But uh, again, later on that year, we uh, were both at uh, a conference in, I guess it was Vail, Colorado, Yes, and and over the the span of Beaver time between Creek. yep Beaver Creek between February and October we had formed a relationship, gotten to know each other. Actually, in Nashville, we had all gone out to eat and had some uh, some buffalo burgers and a great time. Matter mm. of fact, I, I got to tell this story because it's so much fun. Uh, I drove. I was headed to the airport from our lunch. It was the last day of the conference. Conference was finished. Myself, you, I believe Cliff Ravenscraft and uh, Pat Flynn and some, one, there might have been one or two other people there. 
We were going to go grab a Buffalo burger at this famous place there. Well, I got there before the rest of the guys. And uh, so I figured, man, I'm going to have fun with this. So I walked in, and the, the sweet little hostess girl met me with a big smile at the front desk. And, and I acted really serious. And I said, ma'am, I said, I have a, a couple of dignitaries, especially one that's coming to, to dine. Do you guys have a private room? She goes, no, we really don't. I said, well, what's the most private space you could get us? And she point, She looked really curiously, and she was trying to figure out, well, who in the world is coming to our restaurant? And finally, she asked me, she goes, can I ask you who's who's going to be here? I said, well, I said, please don't make a big deal of it. We try to keep everything on the down low, but uh, President George W. Bush is going to be here with a few of us just having a bite of lunch together. She, Her eyes got as big as saucers. It was so cute and so funny. And I, I worked it, man. I worked it. Do you hear me? <laughs> I worked it. <laughs> that that's a that's a day in the life. Oh, that's, that, that's what I get to enjoy every single day. It was fun, man. And uh, and let me just tell our, our since you can't. And by the way, on our website, on this podcast post, you're going to see pictures of John there. So you'll you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. This guy, without a whole lot of makeup, if any, without really any kind of funky hairdos, this guy needs no prosthetics. God uniquely designed his face to look like George W. Bush. So John walks in the restaurant, man, and I'm I'm there to greet him. And this girl, I think she almost wet herself, man. She just lost it. And and for like 10, 15 minutes, she was stumbling over herself, just eyes big, and you know, and we got him seated and everything. And it was probably, I don't know, a few minutes into the meal that I, I pulled her aside. I said, honey, I said, this is John Morgan, my friend. He just looks like George W. It was so much fun. But man, we've had a lot of fun. But over the course of last year, we got to know each other a lot. And uh yes. But man, at our, our time together at Vail, Colorado, uh, God really melted our hearts together. We discovered so much about each other's stories. And I want you just to share with uh, the audience a little bit about your background, how you, not really just how you came to be George W. impersonator, but what what is who is John C. Morgan and how have you gotten to where you are today? Well, you know, Brian, when I was... I mean, and I'm not going to take three hours to do this, but I'll just say as a five-year-old, I was one of those kids that was obnoxiously cute, you know, charming. And, you know, if if you gave me half a chance, I'd make you sit and listen while I sang you three songs, you know, one of those kind of kids you just want to smack. And uh, <laughs> so that that's how I started out in life. Well, when I got into school, uh, that sort of personality doesn't really work. And so I was... Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I just knew I had cooties, and everybody hated me. You know, and uh, so I dealt with extreme rejection for many years and some abuse. And and so by the time I got into high school, I knew. All right, look, I'm not going to have. I'm not going to go through this. I've got to develop some way to cope with life. And so I created an a false front, an exterior uh, personality that was cool. I could play guitar, you know, and. Uh, did drugs and did all that stuff, but it wasn't me. The The real me was scared, rejected. Um, I didn't know what love was. I didn't know how it felt. Uh, I hadn't, you know, all through high school, I, I never cried because I had just turned my emotions off as a protection mechanism against all the ridicule. Sure, sure. Uh, when I was a little kid, I used to cry real easy and, and, uh, you know, the, the guys in my class would take advantage of that. And so I just shut it all down. Well, in 1975, um, I met Jesus Christ and wow, he, he gave me himself as a gift. Uh, what an honor because I knew that he knew all of my darkness, all of my, um, secrets. And yet he loved me anyway. And, uh, it was thrilling to have a relationship with him. But nobody else knew my secrets. So I continued to live a double life, now just only inside the church. Mm -hmm. And it took me some uh, pretty heavy-duty instances to come to a place where I was willing to confess my sin and reveal myself to my pastor. And that was really the beginning of a total transformation because, Brian, as your listeners know and as you know, any sin that you keep in the dark remains empowered in your life. That darkness is power. Yep. And uh, when you turn on the light, it dispels the darkness, and, and then suddenly the light has the power. And so I you know, began to walk in the light, and, and then shortly after that, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good on guitar, and, and I can write songs. So 
I I thought I'll record an album and and go around and sing uh, for churches and stuff. And some along that time, I met my beautiful bride Kathy, who I am um, delighted to say I've been married to for uh, 32 years now. Uh, before I met Kathy, I I had no control over uh, the sensual side of my nature, but from the day I met Kathy until today, I'm grateful to say. God has uh, delivered me in such a way that I'm able to say I've been faithful since the day I met her. Yay, God. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so so uh, decided to go into the music business, but I lacked two key ingredients to make it in the music business, uh, talent and integrity. And mm. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, I had marginal talent, but uh, I had no management skills and I was kind of starving my young budding family. And so after a few years and recording a couple albums, I decided to hang up my guitar. But Brian and I, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, John, don't forget, I used Moses after 40 years on the backside of the desert. Well, when you're 20-something, you don't want to hear about the backside of the desert in 40 years, you know. <laughs> exactly. But still, it stuck with me. And, and it actually helped me because I was not released by the Lord to do something significant again for the next 20 years. And I went through a transformation of being anxious, being anxious, you know, okay, God, now, now we ready, we ready now, now. And, um, you know, my great fear was that I would miss God's will almost as though there was a train coming. And if I missed it, you know, it would be all over. And, uh, over the years I was taught that God, of course, is sovereign, that he is all-powerful, that he knows everything, that he sees everything, and that he has the planets in perfect order and alignment. There is no doubt in his power to make sure that I'm where I need to be when he wants me to be there. And so over time, I learned how to trust him, just rest and learn to actually have joy while waiting. And yet I, you know, I, I didn't know what waiting meant. I had no idea what would emerge. And I just, I had this, you know, aching heart to sing to people. I was a minstrel. Um, it, you know, during this time I served on our worship te- team at church doing through these entire 20 years, but I just knew there was more. And so a long, t- a long, uh, you know, 12 years ago or so, um, actually about uh, 15 years ago or so, uh, Governor George W. Bush decides to become candidate George W. Bush. And uh, we know we had the, the governor, uh, Jeb Bush, in Florida, and I liked him. I thought, well, George probably make a great president. And, you know, I checked him out and did some reading and whatnot, and I, I decided to support him. And we were actually setting up chairs at one of his rallies uh, back when he was running, and one of his staffers was the very first person to point at me and say, hey, you know, you look a lot like W. And that was the first time I heard it, Brian. But as his face became more and more recognizable, I started hearing it all the time. Still, I had no clue there was anything I could do with it. And it was actually three years into George Bush's first term at the occasion of my mom's 80th birthday party when a friend of the family came up and said, John, you know, there's this emerging industry of lookalikes, people who look like celebrities, and they hire them out to go to parties and shake hands and this and that. And she said, John, you would be perfect for that. And I'm like, no, thank you. You know, I, I had this religious paradigm that had no room for, you know, God being behind an Elvis impersonator or a Cher impersonator <laughs> or even a W impersonator. And I just summarily said, you know, no way. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, what would people think? You know, what would my kids think? You know, it was fear of man. It was fear of rejection. Going back to your was, childhood. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Going back to the childhood thing. And uh, so I just dropped it. But you know who didn't drop it? My wife, Kathy. <laughs> she, she didn't say anything to me, but she kept it. You, you know, she pondered it in her heart. Sure. And then about three months later, uh, she was watching television and saw somebody impersonating President Bush on national TV. And the thought hit her, do a web search. So she went and, you know, got online and she found these two guys that were impersonating President Bush and, you know, apparently doing it full time. They had agents and it was real cool. And she thought, gee... 
John looks way more like George Bush than this guy and this other guy. It's all prosthetics. He, he doesn't look anything like President Bush. And so she got all excited and she came and she, you know, came into the room and flipped on the light and grabbed me by the scruff of the pajamas and said, I, I've just found out your new career. You're going to become a George Bush impersonator. <laughs> and I mean, she woke me from a dead sleep with, you know, with that wow. looking up and there's her face, you know, and she drug me to the computer, showed me those two sites. And when I saw them, that's when my heart opened just the tiniest bit, thinking that maybe, maybe. But still, I thought, no, nah, this isn't for me. But Brian, here's the thought that, that really did it, that, that caused me to actually pursue it. I had this thought right here. What if it's God? Because mm -hmm. see, I, I sold myself out to God many years ago. I'm all in with the Lord Jesus. And I don't want to do anything that he doesn't want me doing. And so especially not a career, you know, big deal, a big deal like that. So, you know, again, I thought there's no way God's going to want somebody to become an impersonator. I mean, come on. But then that thought hit me and I thought, oh, boy. And I realized I had to pray about it. I, I realized I had to find out for sure. So I fasted and prayed and wouldn't talk to God about it or nothing. Wouldn't talk to anybody. And after two weeks, you know, because fasting helps to prepare you spiritually to, to discern the, the will of God, I just asked God. I said, okay, God, do you want me to become a George Bush impersonator? And Brian, it was one of those deals where it wasn't audible with my ears, but it was so clear in my heart that it yeah. might as well have been audible. The Lord did an audible. <laughs> and, uh, and he spoke to me and said, yes. And you'll be doing it for five years. Now, those were the words I heard in my ears. It was three years into George Bush's first term. And I looked over at my wife and I said, honey, I think God just told me George Bush is going to be reelected. Oh, wow. Because you just do the math, you know? Oh, yeah, sure. And, and I knew I needed to become a George Bush impersonator. And so I did. And now, you know, the rest is history. Been all over the world. Had the chance to. I had no clue at the beginning that it could have a ministry aspect I thought maybe it'd just be a comedian, you know, and I've been privileged to be the GMA's Comedian of the Year a few years ago, and all that's been really cool. But then to have the privilege of speaking in churches, starting off with the comedy, and then speaking a very powerful and meaningful word out of the scriptures. One of the things that strikes me about you, and, and of course, I've had the privilege of knowing you now for a while, but you, you're you really the quintessential example of of so much of what I share in in my work, and that is that so many times we we dismiss or overlook or discount the the value, the gifts, even the simple things that we possess because of our created nature, what God's uniquely made us to be. We we just don't give it a second thought. We just kind of overlook it, or in some cases, because of our past. Because of our our shady dark sides that and, and secrets and things that and and by the way I'm very public about my story as well, or even maybe about our insecurities and our own you know we're not real sure we're all that or a bag of chips, uh, whatever the case may be, we we oh we just kind of dismiss the possibilities we dismiss could God use me in that arena could God open a door for me there you know. It, and really, it's not a matter of could he. My gosh, he's capable of anything and everything. I teach strongly, you know this, that I believe our destiny is prescribed for us before we ever got here. So it's not like God's trying to decide what his will is for our life. It's it's whether or not we can come into enough truth and belief and faith in our hearts concerning what he said about us that we engage it and and go for it and, and step into it, you know. And watching your life the last couple of years and, and hearing your story encourages me so much. And I pray it's encouraging somebody else because I know there are thousands of people that you get in front of every year that that in their hearts intuitively know there's something unique and special for them to accomplish and do and to contribute to others. Yet there's that fear piece. There's that whole that whole deal about, you know, am I the guy? Am I the gal? Am I capable? Am I worthy? You know, what? but what about my mistakes? And all these little voices we play with in our head. You know, I've got 27 people in my head. I think you told me you had 44. So you're you're one up on me. Uh, but 
You know, you, you told me something here a while back that just kind of rocked my world. You began to share with me a message that God had put in your heart for this particular season on the war on fear. And, and I, you know, you know my story. I, I have looked fear dead in the eyes, man, and had to overcome that. And that battle, that place of conflict or threshold moment, I guess, in my life was what thrust me into what I'm doing now. But w- tell me about this war on fear. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Uh, what are people dealing with, and how can they go about really engaging this process of declaring war on fear and knowing that we we can already stand in the victory? You know, I was in my uh, at my church one day, and I found myself playing a script, if you will, in my mind that was challenging the Word of God. You know, we all have different levels in which we participate with the Word of God. And then, you know, I'll believe this much, but not this much. I believe yeah, yeah. this much, but I, I couldn't possibly believe way over here. And the scriptwriter that contradicts what God says about life, about God himself, or about us, is none other than the enemy of our souls. Yes, sir. Um, and and so out loud during this worship service at church, I just said, I declare war on unbelief. At that time, it was unbelief. I've, I've got this little bracelet here. It says, believe, believe, I, like it. I believe. And, and, and then an, another, another front on that war came a short while later as I was in my home, and I realized that fear was effectively keeping me from doing the the very thing I I knew I was supposed to be doing, fear. You know, and and fear has a script as well. Well, what if, typically, or yeah, but, you know, and there are things that, yeah, well, if I do that, and it's negative. It's a thought-based attempt to stop you in your tracks from doing the very thing in your heart you long to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the operating scripture, Brian, is John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. And, but the other side of that verse is so encouraging. But I have come, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And so my war is against the scriptwriter that tries to convince me to take the lazy route, to take the easy route, to take the road most traveled rather than to take the the hard way that God is calling me to, to accomplish the things that I know he's put on my heart to do. And, you know, each one of us every single day, I mean, I have had the privilege of speaking in so many churches where the seats are filled with people with dreams that are yes. dusty sitting on a shelf because they've long ago abandoned the attempt to live that dream because of the scriptwriter telling them, nope, they're disqualified for this or that reason. So I'm mad. I'm glad I'm mad. You know, I, <laughs> I, I've, I've got this little phrase, you know, I hate how much I love my sin and I love how much I hate it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I love how much I hate the devil. You know, I love how much I hate the devil. And, uh, and I am uh, on a mission, really, to see people, r- number one, recognize, because that's the thing. If you don't think about the script writer, if you don't think about, you know, if you don't look behind the scene, kind of pull back the curtain like on The Wizard of Oz to reveal the deceptor, uh, you, you'll, you'll think that that's just you thinking. Right. But, but once you take two steps back and realize, wait a second, I am being played here. Yeah, yeah. You know, then, then you, can, you can just waste your whole life and, and get to the end of your life and look back and think, man, I missed it. I yeah, missed yeah. it. And, and I, just, I just long to see people get to the end of their life and, you know, just slide into home plate, you know, and what a ride. You know, man, that's that's uh, everybody who's listening to this on the the podcast today. They know my heart. They know what we talk about all the time, and and it becomes very obvious very quickly why you and I were connected and why uh, there's such a kindred spirit 
because, uh, you know, my story is not much unlike yours. And like you, I've traveled literally the world, been in hundreds of churches, been in front of tens of thousands of people over the years. And it breaks my heart to know the the magnitude of potential that's already been determined by God is possible and is his will and his plan sitting idly by either broken, hurting, disillusioned, or somehow in deception because, like you said, the script writer has convinced them that they are someone other than who God says they are. And uh, one of my great missions in life, much like yours, is to look the lies straight in the face, to challenge them, to teach people how to, to really deal with untruth and how to uproot those things and how to pull down as the scripture says, pull down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That is what God knows about you. And I want to help equip people to yank that stuff down, to dismantle the, the, this framework that's literally holding them hostage to a lesser life than what God has for them. I'm pumped to have you just co-laboring and, and arm in arm in, in this season of our lives, man, because I, I believe God's releasing so many people to accomplish their dreams. Me too, bro. Uh, it's just fun. I, I, for so many years, bro, I, I lost that five-year-old. I lost that kid who would just walk up to a stranger. Uh, I became someone who just was uh, completely owned by the fear of rejection. And I could step onto a stage because that was different than one-on-one interaction. But, you know, when I was in a group of people, if they started getting intimate, Mm -hmm. man, I was looking for the door. Yeah. Uh, Because I didn't want to be revealed. I I couldn't be revealed. I had to stay in my my hidden little zone of deception where I had, you know, created this world of uh, false security and false front. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want people seeing into my dark closet. But uh, once, you know, once uh, the lights came on, I was shocked to find that the lie that I had been told for decades Mm -hmm. was in fact a lie. And I wasn't rejected. I was loved. I was accepted. I was helped. And uh, you've got some listeners out there right now, Brian, that need to know that. Absolutely. That that there is is, uh, not uh, somebody with a machete waiting to just tear you down. Uh, if you reveal your your hidden secrets, uh, in fact, the opposite is true. There's a, there's a loving group of people in the church of, of of the Lord, who will love you and accept you and serve you and help you. And I'm not saying there's not bad churches because I mean there's some people who probably who have been burned <laughs> by Christians, you know, and it's, that happens. But you got to find the good the good folks. You got to you got to find genuine Christians with that love and, and that uh, don't judge. You know, you mentioned something a moment ago, uh, John, that just struck me, and I want to just take a jab at this for a few minutes here. Uh, you talked about how, you know, you were you were fine on stage in front of the crowd, but you you struggled allowing your heart to to be open to real relationship and, and real connection with, with individuals. Man, that resonated with me because so many people who struggle with rejection or feeling as though they're not affirmed or accepted or worthy or whatever the case may be, uh, we we tend to, and I, I did this for many, many years, man, I did this. Frankly, I, I believe I'm only coming now into a season of my life where it doesn't have the same hold on me. But we tend to engage in performance orientation and we'll we'll perform for the masses so that we get applause or response, which is really a pseudo-approval. I mean, they approve our performance, but they don't know us as a person. But but it, that does stroke something in our heart, and it, it provides a temporary Band-Aid. In fact, it's not really that different than those who struggle with alcoholism or drug addiction or sex addiction or whatever the case may be, because all of those activities are ways to medicate and temporarily deal with the pain associated with some need that's not being met. And, uh, man, that just struck me when you said that because that, I've never thought of it that way. You were, you were so comfortable in front of a mass crowd, but there were walls built around your heart and you wouldn't let any individual in. And, and man, what a 
a difficult place to live. And then you you went on from that and talked about this whole idea of of acceptance. What is acceptance? You know, it's just a few years ago, man, when I literally had this encounter with the Lord as it relates to just me being accepted, just him approving of me, just saying, you know what? You're my kid. I love you. You're awesome. I made you. You you just, you know, and to know that his approval is all we really need. And so we we perform for one. That's him. And as we're performing for one to please the heart of the Father, then he in turn is working through us to achieve his purposes and his plans. And in doing that, other people's lives are being impacted by the purity and the essence of who he made us to be. And uh, I tell you what, man, that's that's strong, brother. That is strong. And I, what great insight. Well, thank you. I love the fact that I get to be an impersonator while hating phoniness. <laughs> the Talk irony. Your irony. That's some serious irony right there. You know, I tell people, you know, be authentic. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes a phony. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, man, listen, and, you told you me. You know, I'll be on. Let me tell you. I'm sorry. Sure. Go, go ahead. ahead, bro. No, go ahead. See, we're good enough friends. We interrupt. Yeah, each go other. ahead. No, go ahead. It's really it. wrong. After you, indubitably. <laughs> um, now I forgot. <laughs> wow. I forgot what I was going to say. Well, it, it had to have been good. Uh, you know, I, I saw you in a performance one time, uh, and you were uh, in character, and you were sharing the three things that really impacted your life, and and that you believe to be a foundational thing of of leadership. So. I'd love for you to share that with my audience. Oh, sure, sure. You know, the uh, the three C's, that courage, communication, and character. That's uh, very important, very important. You know, it takes a lot of courage to do what I did, uh, run the country, fight terrorists, uh, be anywhere close to Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody put a bumper sticker on the limo that says, Duck, duck, goose, Cheney's loose. <laughs> just a little joke we have up here in the belt loop you know uh you know but when you're when you're a leader you, you've got to you've got to lead with focus on your values and your principles you know you gotta ignore folks that, that think your ideas aren't any good it's something i had to learn how to do <laughs> and but it's okay it made me tough i got thick skin like an elephant which is of course the symbol of uh, our Republican Party. My, my Democratic <laughs> friends out there are depicted as a donkey, <laughs> or as my friends to the South call them, burritos. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, the the, the second C is uh, communication, and Brian, do not misunderstand. <laughs> communication is the most important part of talking. <laughs> it, it's it's true. Uh, it's true. You know, studies show that good communication is actually only about 15% verbal, which in my case is a good thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> even though I sometimes boogerize my vernacular, I am fluent in over nine different body languages, <laughs> some of which I had to abandon once I got saved. So anyway, oh, wow. uh, you've got to be very careful. you got to be very intensified when you're, when you're bilingual, <laughs> as of course I am. Because otherwise you can create an international incident, as I learned recently during a trip to Krakistan. <laughs> There's a big difference between saying I want a cracker and I am a cracker. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Oh, uh, yes. The, you know, and, and on it goes. The third C, of course, is uh, character. Character. And, uh, you know, everybody knows what I mean by character. <laughs> it's who you are when no one's looking. That's right. You know, integrity, morality, traditional family values, you know. But your college days don't count because that's before you knew you had a shot at the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John, you're unbelievable, man. I Thank tell you, you what, you know, uh, as you have gone on this amazing journey and you've come to this place in your life today, and this is the discussion you and I, you and I have all the time offline, uh, both of us have this sense that man, we are standing at the precipice of something remarkable with all of the stuff going on in the world, with all of the, the fear-mongering, with all of the, the bad economic news, with all of the agendas uh, you know, on all sides of every aisle being carried out. You know, Just with all the stuff happening around us, I keep 
encouraging folks that, you know, we're in the world, but we're not of it. We, we, are, we are of a kingdom that is just, frankly, immune to this stuff, unless we, of course, give our minds and hearts over to it. But man, as, as we're coming into this, this season right now, I know you're anticipating great things. I know you your faith is high and 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 you're watching as things beginning to unfold. Talk to our folks just briefly in wrapping this up tonight. Uh mm-hmm. what what do you see ahead, man? What what are your words of encouragement regarding people's future and what they can look toward? Well, I you know, I want to encourage your friends to go for it. And what I mean by that is to jump into your relationship with Christ like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Dig into him and dig into that relationship. You see, that's the script you want to listen to, what God is calling you to, what he says about you. You know, uh, you have the mind of Christ. It's amazing. He, You know, do you ever stop and just ponder what it means that God, the creator of the universe, lives inside of you? It's amazing. I mean, wow. That's it's huge. amazing. Yeah, that's it's huge. That's humongified. Yep. I mean, it's just huge. And what does that mean potentially? I mean, does it mean we can walk on water? Does it mean we can heal the sick? Does it mean we can raise the dead? I sure. think it means all that. Absolutely. You know, and and so I, I really, really, really want to pull out the stops and maximize. In fact, Brian, this has been the number one prayer I've prayed over 40 years of being a believer maximize my life for your glory. Lord, maximize your glory through my life. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well, you know, I I believe that the glory of God is seen in the earth when his sons and his daughters are right in the middle of what they were created to do and they're doing it. When, When we are being, literally being the man, the woman, the person that God created us to be, and when we're about, as Jesus said, about the Father's business, the the Father's business is whatever he sent you here to do. And when we do that, I do believe the glory of God is is realized and recognized and noticed in a world that is so full of darkness. Uh, You know, it's not going to be some bright light coming out of the sky. It's not going to be some superstar celebrity that, that hits, you know, a pulpit in a church near you. It, it's about the sons and daughters of God simply coming into what it is that they've they've been placed here to do and just being that. And, you know, tonight on this broadcast, you have shared with us the the faith, the, the story, the testimony of a person who you've been through hell, you've been through all kinds of difficult times, man, but you persevered, and, and with God's help, we're now on the other side of it, and we're about to experience what it looks like to to really establish the kingdom of God in the earth. And man, you are the kind of relationship that I'm grateful God's given me in my life this season. I cannot tell you how much uh, it means for me to have you on the program. And just FYI, dude, we have to do this like periodically, frequently. Like, you know what's ro- rolling in my heart? Da da da. I know we need the Rocky theme going on, right? Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I'm, I'm feeling it. I mean, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a huge wave of God's joy, yeah. just happening. You know, and uh, as we consider the exploits that He has for us, I want to think of myself as a warrior in His army, ready to go out there and do battle Absolutely, to kick man. some serious devil butt. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, John Morgan, where can people find out more about your work, about your ministry, and what you're doing? Tell us how we can get in contact with you. Well, you know, Brian, before I say that, I, I think it's quickly uh, important for me to add that I do an awful lot of corporate settings. Yes. Uh, folks hire me to come to their company, and you won't hear any of this side of me. If if you hire me for a corporate setting, you'll see it in the yeah. way I serve. Yes, yeah, sure. You'll see it in the way I love. You'll see it in the way I live, but you won't, you know, you won't hear it. You can, you can, uh, you can hire me and not worry about, uh, is this guy going to offend, uh, the Muslims in the crowd? You know, I, I, listen, I, I, I'm a servant, so I know, you know, where this and that, or the other thing is appropriate. So just ha- having, uh, wanted to give that out there Absolutely. for those, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, corporate CEOs and whatnot that'll be hiring me as a result of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, 
And then uh, you can go to my website, johncmorgan.com. You can go to my blog, johncmorgan.tv. You can uh, uh, Twitter me, um, Bush Guy is my handle, and you can go to uh, YouTube. And there's tons of videos that you can you know, quickly Google. And uh, we'll have some fun together. And, I, you know, I want to get to know all your listeners. I, I, I would love to have them come and join my community Absolutely. and uh, have the privilege of serving alongside you and alongside this wonderful, wonderful army that God's raising up. Well, I'll tell you what, johncmorgan.com. Just find that one. You'll find all the rest of them if you can't remember any other ones. And by the way, in our show notes, we're going to have his bio. We'll have a a link to his website, also a link to his – he has a great book out. Tell us about your book real quick because I I won't be able to know. You you wrote an amazing book about your story. So what's the name of the book and how can we get that? Thank you. It is on uh, my website, johncmorgan.com. It's called My Life as a Bush and My Heart for Imitating Jesus. It is a motivational, autobiographical, comedy, uh, uh, devotional. It's kind of got all of those features. It's uh, an easy read. Each chapter is just a couple of pages with questions for reflection at the end of each chapter. It's uh, it's it's simple. It's funny. A lot of funny stories like when I kind of busted onto The View uh, you know, standing up in the wax museum and freaking people out left and right, you know, <laughs> a lot of crazy, crazy stories, but also spiritual lessons that I learned as a result of each one of those. So awesome. on my website, you can get my book, my audio book, my DVD, and there's some shirts and fun stuff on there as well. Miss me yet. John C. Morgan.com. Everybody. Have you enjoyed this? I know you have John. We'll do it again. Very, very soon. My brother. Well, man, I hope you absolutely got as much value and excitement and joy out of that as I did. I promise you we'll have John back on, man. That just that kind of conversation gets me juiced up to deal with the past, resolve it, put it behind you, fight the fight, the good fight of faith, be a member of the army of the war on fear, and go out and be all God's called you to be. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, Just be sure to share this with somebody and uh, let everybody know about brianholmes.com and what's happening here in this community. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you very, very soon. Take care.